Okay, so just a few seconds and we're going uh, live on YouTube. And we're starting to have lots of attendees now. Okay, so we're live. Good morning, uh, everybody. Thank you so much for, for joining uh, this uh, MPPN and OFI uh, seminar. We're delighted to be hosting uh, this seminar uh, jointly with the uh, Office of uh, National Stat Statistics from Colombia. Um, it's going to be a really, really interesting discussion. Um, and we, uh, we're hoping that the event will last uh, more or less an hour. Um, I'm going to pass it on to Gonzalo, who is our, our moderator and is going to give the welcoming words. So, Gonzalo, up to you. Thank you very much, uh, Felipe. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It's really a pleasure to have another event of the multidimensional positive peer network, and we call it NPPN. I thank you for being here, both to participants of the network and, and guests. Um, as you know, NPPN is a space where countries, governments, statistical offices, but also international institutions get together and exchange ideas about development, poverty, specifically multidimensional poverty. The network was started in 2013 in Oxford, and luckily it was launched by Amartya Sen, by President Santos from Colombia, and by Sabine Alcair, director of OFI. Uh, the network started with only 20 countries, but now we have uh, 60 countries and 20 international institutions. And I believe the most important activity we have is the exchange of ideas. This exchange has produced more than 23 official national multidimensional poverty indicators, MPIs. In fact, two days ago, the Seychelles Islands launched their MPI, congratulations to the Seychelles Islands. Uh, and all this is due to the exchange of ideas we have between participants. So please uh, join the network, uh, join the network as countries, as institutions, we welcome you here. Uh, and today we have our very first public event. Uh, thanks for being here. This is a special day. Uh, in this event, we will talk about COVID-19, but we will be talking about possible solutions. Of course, we need to acknowledge the problem due to this pandemic, but let's try to find solutions. Today, Sabine Alcair and Monica Pinilla will show to us how can we use multidimensional poverty and vulnerability indices so we can target better people with higher risk in developing countries. We believe these are important tools for governments to the society. They will have 15 minutes. And thank you very much to Sabina and Monica. And then we will have Juan Daniel Oviedo. He's the director of the Statistical Office of Colombia, DANE, and he will talk about the concrete experience of Colombia using multidimensional poverty indicators, using the type information, and then designing income policies for the poor population to address COVID now in Colombia. You will have 20 minutes. Thank you very much, Juan Daniel and his team, Laura. Thank you very much to Felipe, to John Hamel, to Michel Mouchet, Mouchet, to my brother, Pali. Um, um, we'll have more events like this one in the future. And thank you for being here. Um, I guess over to you, Sabina and Monica. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gonzalo, and I'm so glad to be with you today. Um, Moni and I will share this presentation and I will start it and, and then she will finish and um, include it. So um, what we are doing is simply trying to learn um, how we can be a network that continues to have our focus and our um, eye on the use of uh, measurement tools to improve policies during this COVID pandemic. Um, and so there are different kinds of objectives that we are observing that MPN members and other uh, actors have. But clearly one is to protect the very most vulnerable from contracting COVID because it might have a devastating impact. 
but another is recognizing the job loss and the recession to target the poor and the new poor with a emergency responses during a period of lockdown or during a time of economic uh, downturn. It's also to anticipate the number and location of additional people who might become poor so that there can be preparedness in different kinds of future scenarios. A third is to monitor the MPI in real time um, so that we can see what policies are working and what are not, but in a very data challenged environment because household surveys cannot go out. Um, and also going beyond, but including cash transfers, which are the first wave of response to think about other vital services. And then to plan the pro poorest recovery, recovery in which in the short term, food needs are met, but also those who are unemployed return to work, perhaps to better jobs. Social services are strengthened, equity is introduced. So we'll end on a note of hope and hope that this very difficult and indeed tragic time could also be a time in which we try to turn a corner on, on poverty in, in many different and varied contexts. But there's no one recipe, no easy solution. So what are the ingredients and tools we are working with? Um, data are the first need in terms of any measurement or quantitative analysis. And with the global MPI, we have harmonized indicators for globally comparable data. But many of you will have national data sets that are you, you are using already for different purposes, the MPI, but also other analyses. Census and registry data, as we'll hear from Juan Daniel Oviedo, um, also can play a huge role. There's a whole burst of energy in new rapid remote so socioeconomic surveys, as well as input from the private sector in marketing surveys, and then the use of administrative records. And so these are the ingredients of data about poverty um, now and in the future that, that we are working with. Um, and the tools in terms of measurement is to step back from where we are, just thinking about poverty statistics, and to recognize that policymakers have so much coming at them at the same time, to really focus on poverty, sometimes it's useful to prioritize. And an MPI brings together pertinent indicators as a structure that can be looked at together. So the global MPI is one tool which is familiar but can be reinterpreted as we'll see but also national MPIs as they are, but also including perhaps new COVID related indicators to build multidimensional vulnerability indices or MVIs is a very common um, activity. And then using micro simulations and projections to predict different scenarios and how this could unfold. And also exploring with targeting where there are targeted activities. Um, and clearly different actors will have different needs for data and measurement, and also bring different skills and novelties to this work. So our hope is to really have a conversation so that we can learn from each other um, how to bring the poor visibly and quantitatively into the policy space. So the biggest challenge seems to be that policy people need information very fast and they are planning activities already, many have been planned and rolled out. And so they need a way to package the data and the MPI um, can help. An existing MPI can help, um, but also new indicators could be packaged using a counting-based approach um, that it might include vulnerabilities. So what I'd like to do is just give three examples um, from the global MPI, from a national MPIs and from bespoke rapid surveys. And Juan Daniel will then turn with a very rich and much more detailed and sophisticated study from Colombia. And then Monica will also share what OFI are already doing, but perhaps not publicly um, with other countries and how might we might wish to collaborate with or learn from many of you because you have a lot now to give. So three case studies, let's say. One is from the global MPI, Multidimensional Poverty Index, which covers over 101 countries and 5.7 billion people. And what it shows at a glance across countries is that deprivations are interlinked within the household. So just to say 
something that's striking to people who don't have a multidimensional approach. Of the 1.3 billion people who are MPI poor, 98.8% of them have at least three deprivations. 83.5% of them have five or more deprivations at the same time. And across each indicator, if you're deprived in one, 81 to 99% of your, the time you're deprived in others. And so just reminding people of this information is key. But then to people who are already multiply deprived, COVID enters. And for many of us, it is a shocking and new exposure, but for the multiply, multiply deprived, it is another addition to an existing deprivation load. And so the potential impact of it, uh, both its severity and its uh, course um, will be different than if that is your only deprivation. So the global MPI in terms of some studies that colleagues have done, which are online with Ricardo Nogales, Christian Oldegas, Jacob Dirksen and others, is first of all, to identify those who are at higher risk of fatality, very sadly. Second, to try to figure out how to reduce the collateral human costs. And third, to make some predictions about how poverty might increase. So for example, if we just look at three indicators, people who are undernourished or have somebody in their household who's undernourished, lack clean water and clean cooking fuel. Um, 3.6 billion people of our set of 5.7 have at least one of these deprivations in their lives and 472 million are deprived in all three. So in terms of a high risk of COVID, um, really having a devastating health effect, those 472 are at high risk and they are at countries with, at that time, high uh, prevalence or low prevalence of, of COVID. But tracking them together can be useful, looking at the number and the level. And doing that subnationally as well as nationally. For example, in Nigeria, the COVID had not yet hit the places where these overlapping COVID-related deprivations were the highest. And also recognizing that not just in one country, but in many countries, the dispersion or the uh, variation in COVID risk across different subnational regions of the country varied a lot. And so thinking about these patterns could help to contain the contagion. And also then, how can we predict increases by micro simulations, um, by anticipating using the World Food Program estimates that 135 million people will have an increase in severe food insecurity and putting that in, or that the children are out of school, or that there's urban to rural migration, which increases living standard deprivations, or adding in new variables like hand washing women who are in informal employments. So this is some of the work with the global MPI data set. At the national level, many countries are innovating with their MPIs. That is, they're exploring additional indicators that may not have been in their original MPI, such as informal employment, if it wasn't there already, intergenerational households, overcrowding, hand washing, ownership of a mobile phone for emergency response, and really the dependency for sharing and caring uh, within the household. So one example very concretely is Afghanistan. I don't know if Dr. Mwahed is on this call, but with permission, we are sharing this. Afghanistan's MPI has five dimensions and they all reiterated the importance because it includes already uh, shocks and employment. But they also focused on micro simulations for increases in food insecurity, uh, water sanitation and cooking fuel, for rises in hunger, in loss of employment, and in out-of-school children. This helps to see what could be the magnitude of new poor in that difficult context. In Pakistan, they needed a very fast emergency response and they did not have data, up-to-date census registry data nor survey data. Um, and so they opened up a demand by SMS and they used a counting technique, which is not an MPI, but it's a counting technique, which was a list of exclusion criteria where they could obtain those by matching the household ID with administrative data. Um, so using a demand response with exclusion criteria 
and the existing beneficiaries, um, they increased their impact of the first wave of cash transfers. And finally, in Bhutan, uh, which is very dependent on the tourist sector, there was a rapid remote assessment uh, of COVID-19 on workers in that sector. And across um, eight indicators in a new multidimensional vulnerability index, 80% of workers were deprived in at least three of these core vulnerabilities. So we could made an individual MPI to analyze it by age and gender and type of job. And then probe coping strategies. For example, who is going back to rural areas? And also interest in retraining, retooling and going back into the labor force in a different way. And plumbing and weaving came up as popular options. So this is just a little bit of the work that we are seeing countries do that is in the public domain. There is other work ongoing um, that is internal to countries. I close with an observation from Amartya Sen in his April 15th Financial Times article, which was that during World War II, there was a food shortage and a decline in food availability in Britain. And the decade before, men's life expectancy had gone up by 1.2 years. But during the war, there was also rationing. And life expectancy for men went up in that decade by 6.5 years and women's by seven years. And so although it was a terrible time, there was a crisis, uh, very tangibly so, uh, by coming together, there was actually then able to be a historic change that endured after those difficult years. So the hope is that by continuing to focus and bring these issues forward um, very strongly, that we will be able um, to escalate poverty as a post-emergency goal. So that's a little bit of what we are doing. I'll turn over to Moni now and her slides um, to talk about how we can support OFI partners. Okay. Thank you, Sabina, and uh, welcome everyone uh, to this webinar. That is the first, and we hope the first of uh, a large number of webinars um, in this topic. So I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to explain what uh, we as OFI can offer and can support countries. We know that this is a, is a situation that, as Sabina mentioned, has put countries in the, in the position that they need to move fast and need to use the data that they have available. And OFI and the FPN are here to help and provide support to all the countries. And the first thing that we are uh, doing with a lot of countries is to provide support in creating a multidimensional vulnerability index. And as Sabina mentioned, in Afghanistan and in Pakistan, we have done this. And is uh, to create a new index that what is capturing is different vulnerabilities to the crisis. And this allows governments to identify those who are the more uh, vulnerable, those who will need transfers and those will, who will need support in the short term, but also it help them to understand what is the situation. It's not only to identify who is vulnerable, but it's to understand what are, why they are vulnerable and which are the areas or the dimensions where they are vulnerable. And this um, multidimensional vulnerability index is that it's possible not only to divide it by urban and, and rural or regions, but also to disaggregate it by different vulnerable groups. So for example, people in the informal labor market or people in the tourist, uh, mar uh, sector. So in that case, governments can establish different uh, policies in order to reduce their vulnerabilities and provide support to them. And in the cases where it's possible, it is also uh, important for us in and provide uh, support for countries in order that they identify not only those who are uh, vulnerable um, in the income setting, but also in the multidimensional poverty setting or the multidimensional vulnerability setting and to compare those vulnerabilities. Because we know that in the short term, the most uh, effective policy, it will be to transfer money. But it's important also to think what are going to be the implications in the middle and the long term, how those households are going to cope with the new normality when uh, COVID-19 passes. So this, uh, this analysis will provide a little bit of information on that in order that policies uh, policymakers can plan in the short and medium term and also in the long term. And one thing that has become really important is to create 
to simulate different situations. So we know that uh, there are several simulations um, and estimations about how poverty, income poverty will increase. But for governments, it's also important to know how multidimensional poverty will increase. If the progress that they have done in the last years is going to be maintained, or what are the settings or the scenarios that they are going to be uh, playing? So simulations will provide that information in order that they can establish different policies. And we as OPI, we can provide support on that. And the other thing is to use census and register data in order to target a, the, and create a vulnerability index. There are countries that have only survey data and we can work with that, but there are other countries like in the case of Colombia that they are going to present that, where there is a, a more complex, or a, mark, a more comprehensive set of uh, survey data or information where you can combine those information, the census and the register data in order to target to have a better target or a more um, specific target. And we can provide support when the when countries have those in order to develop or design their vulnerability index and also uh, to analyze that data. And one thing that is really important, and as Amina mentioned in, in one of her slides, is that now we don't have the same data that we used to have before. There is a lot of surveys that they cannot go to field. The, 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 this year, most of the countries will not be able to collect new data, but there are different collection methods that can be used in order to collect the, the information that is important to target populations and is important to develop policies. And we as SOFI also can provide uh, support on those. And we are happy to help you and happy to learn from you because we know that every country in the world is doing a lot of interesting things and us as OPI are really uh, interested in learn how countries are managing this situation and to contribute in what we can. If you have any questions or you want to contact us, please uh, drop me an email. We are really open to talk, to have a conversation, just to learn from you or if you need our support, uh, we are there for you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sabina and Monica for very interesting insights about multidimensional tools for COVID response. Uh, please don't forget if you have any questions to send it to us through to the to the internet, please, so we can have it at the end of the of the talk. Now um, over to you, Juan Daniel, to learn about um, Colombia. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Gonzalo and uh, uh, Big hello and warm hello to Sabina, Monica, and the rest of the team of the MPPN and OP. Um, we are very glad to be here. And what we are going to show uh, is uh, a very important achievement that Colombia has managed to, to develop in very fast time, taking into account that we have been uh, believers, let's say, of the multidimensional poverty index as a tool, as an strategic tool to develop public policy uh, and more specifically socioeconomic public policy targeting in Colombia. And that's why we are very happy to be here with Laura. Laura, she is the coordinator of the poverty measurement group that we have at the direction of the National Statistics Office. And she has managed to, to learn in a very fast way, which is the strategic message that Sabina has uh, shared with us. Uh, taking into account that measurement of poverty in the way of uh, multidimensional poverty indices allow it uh, is a very important way to uh, understand that uh, socioeconomic shocks of poor and, or over poor and vulnerable people are also multidimensional. And as Sabina mentioned before, uh, COVID-19 could be a new dimension 
of this vulnerability indices that we have to manage and that we have to understand in the forthcoming future. That's why we, we prepared uh, a very short presentation, Laura and myself, uh, in order to share with you, which is the main experience that we have uh, managed to, to follow and to develop in the last months in Colombia, uh, taking again, taking into account that we have been measuring poverty with a multidimensional approach since let's say 10 years ago in Colombia. And we have been learning a lot from Oki, uh, Roberto Angulo, who is one of the seeds from in Colombia from the public policy perspective of introducing this multidimensional poverty index uh, is uh, a member and is, is some it's a very important person at Oki, and he has managed to put all the Colombian politicians and the public policy around this measurement of multidimensional poverty index. Uh, what we want to share with you is the, which is the use of the statistical information in order to develop some uh, guiding principles in order to manage in a very relevant and even in a very sound way, the socioeconomic impacts of COVID-19 in Colombia. And we, we wanted to share with you something we didn't manage to translate it in English, but this is what we call uh, the, the new way of understanding uh, our developing data ecosystem in Colombia and our national a statistical system that we are deploying in, in the last four years. We've been deploying the national statistical system in Colombia since five years ago, let's say. And we wanted to show it as a pill. As, so let's say as a solution or a healthy way to solve the main problems that a uh, COVID-19 is going to produce or is producing already in our society, in more particularly in the Colombian uh, socioeconomic network uh, in our country. And that, that's why we wanted to, to, to develop a, a, a perspective of the national statistical system or the data ecosystems to get and work and line together around a statistical information and to have a multi a stakeholder approach in order to develop a cooperation and coordination around a statistical production in order uh, uh, to information to become the pill that is going to solve many bad consequences of uh, COVID-19 in, in our socioeconomic network. And that's why we wanted to, to share with you how uh, being prepared and how being accountable at the multidimensional poverty measurement in our country allowed us to, to interact the information of the population and housing census with uh, administrative records, with uh, the perspective or the policy framework of our multidimensional poverty index in Colombia in order to provide solutions and in order to target and to show who is vulnerable right now, taking into account the transmission channels of the COVID-19 shocks in the income distribution and in the socioeconomic perspective in our country. What we have in Colombia is an MPI uh, that we managed to share with you uh, at uh, the first week of March in some other scenario that we wanted to thank again Sabina and Gonzalo for the invitation at the a statistical commission in New York just before all this pandemic situation. And we have a five dimension, a multi-dimensional poverty index 
uh, under which we have the housing uh, housing standards or housing conditions, child youth and youth conditions, the health dimension, and quality of employment dimension, and quality and access of education for uh, all the dwellings in our country. And this is a five dimension index that have 15 uh, characteristics that become deprivations uh, under the, the jargon of the MPI. But we, we wanted to use the information of the National Housing and Population Census as a source, not only of an aggregate number of how many inhabitants in Colombia we have, but we wanted to allow the, the linkage of the geospatial information that lies behind the National Housing and Population Census with the socioeconomic characteristics that we grasp in the census in order to have a very disaggregated uh, measurement of an MPI in Colombia that we managed to construct taking into account that uh, Colombia is trying to integrate uh, alternative sources of information as administrative records with the statistical information that we grasp in the housing and population census. So we managed to develop an MPI at a, a street block level, as you might see at the right panel of, the, of this slide, we have the city. This is an intermediate city of Colombia, Monteria, which is close to the Caribbean coast in Colombia. And there you can see how the MPI is distributed about or among a, a street block levels of, the, of that city. And you can see which are the main points under which we have vulnerability and population at risk, taking into account that uh, COVID-19 is biased, uh, is gender biased, is poverty biased, and it's also comorbidity biased uh, with some conditions of, or health conditions of the population. So taking into account that we are integrating the information of the population census with health administrative records and with social security and pension system records. We managed under the emergency act that uh, many of our governments have deployed this, uh, this constitutional, uh, let's say, uh, bypass situation under which uh, the government takes uh, some legis legisl legisl legislative powers in order to take measures to face the shocks of the COVID-19. And we managed to introduce in the Emergency Act a situation under which the confidentiality or the information that we grasp at the, the population census that we have, I don't know, we call the Privacy Act that the National Statistics Office has to perform in order to allow the confidentiality of information to share this confidentiality rules with in need governmental institutions, both at the national and subnational level, in order to use the MPI information that we have already published at the shape file uh, level, but also with the deprivations that we have in, of every household at every street block level in our country in order to use the information to rapidly uh, provide answers to the population as uh, groceries or humanitarian groceries to very poor people uh, and very vulnerable people that could be located, take it into account that we manage to have a very disaggregated distribution of multidimensional poverty in all the rural and urban areas of our country. So what we managed to perform uh, rapidly is to build a master data set under which we 
manage to cross location information, social demographic information, the census-based multidimensional poverty index and all its 15 deprivations, but also labor market individual situations and monetary poverty indicators that we managed to grasp from the household surveys in our country. And we managed to share this information with uh, municipalities, authorities, with uh, state authorities that managed to use the information to target population at risk face uh, or facing the COVID-19 shock. And the, the main important issue that we have in Colombia is that together with the housing and population census, the modern social policy of Colombia has developed a targeting a database, which is what we call the CISBAN. And the CISBAN is the, it's a targeted, let's say census, that grasps socioeconomic and social demographic information of population, which is vulnerable and that is subject to a public policy, to conditional transfers or to unconditional transfers as we are going to show in the following slide. So in Colombia, this database, the CISPEN database is managed and under the administration of the Ministry of Planning, but we call a DNP, as we call the National Statistics Office DANE in Colombia. And the DNP or the Ministry of Planning is in charge of grasping all this information that is targeted for people living under lower socioeconomic strata. And in Colombia, we have a, a stratification of population uh, at six levels. So the C-SPAN database grasp information at, uh, as, as a census-based uh, uh, logistical information grasping at the uh, strata one, two, and three in order to uh, represent or to develop a database which is a, a socioeconomic targeting subset of the aggregate population in our country. And therefore, uh, the CISBEN also, as a mirror of what we did with the census uh, housing and population census information, the Ministry of Planning integrated uh, several administrative records of social policy, which is in place or was in place in Colombia before the COVID-19 shock and developed also a CISPEN master database, which includes all the generations of this uh, information, grasp these procedures, which is at the fourth version, and also uh, integrated the uh, housing and population census information in order to improve the quality and the targeting uh, capabilities of this information data set. And afterwards, this information uh, or this CISPEN master uh, database was shared by the Ministry of Planning with all local governments in the country in order to complement the information of the population census, in order to target uh, measures for poor and vulnerable population with some humanitarian uh, strategies that were developed in a very fast way, in a very smart way in our country, taking into account uh, the existence and the pre-existence of these information sets. Afterwards, what we did is, let's say if, we, if Colombia, we had the chance of ourselves to have a very recent population census that was based over under two main assumptions that we wanted to highlight in this conversation, which is the identification of the population which is counted in the, in the census and the geolocation of all the dwellings that we are counting in the population census. So taking into account that we have the ID numbers and the geo 
location of all the households or the dwellings in our country, we started to see if we managed to integrate this information with some health records in order to provide a smart information in order how to manage the COVID-19 shocks in our country. And that's why we rapidly uh, managed to develop uh, a COVID-19 vulnerability index that results mainly from the integration of the population census and what we call the uh, health, the individual health records of all the in inhabitants that are subject to social security system in our country under which we have all the medical history and the comorbidities of the population that thanks into account that we have the identification of this population and at the same time we have the ID numbers of the same population and the addresses or the geolocation of their dwellings. We managed to set some measures uh, taking into account the work of McCall in 2020, which is uh, uh, they developed in, the, in this academic uh, paper, they developed an index that managed to show how vulnerable we could be if we contract the COVID-19 disease and we have some risk factors, not only from the health perspective, but also from the social demographic perspective. And that's why we integrated and developed a vulnerability index that takes into account the pre-existence of pathologies that are uh, or increase the probability of complications of the COVID-19 disease as hypertension, diabetes, heart diseases or lung diseases and cancer, but also at the same time, uh, as we had the uh, housing and population census, we managed to set some risk factors as the intergener intergenerational dwellings uh, that we call it households under which we have uh, elder people living together with younger people that are asymptomatic, let's say. And this is a very important risk factor and also taking into account that the population census uh, it grasped all the information of the main dimensions and the main characteristics of the EMPI. We introduced the overcrowding situation and also the vulnerability that is uh, originated at the fact of single or individual households or single uh, inhabited households with elder people. With all this information, we managed to put together the administrative records of the health and the individual health records with the individual records that we have at the, or that we had at the population census. And we managed to, at the street block level, to develop a vulnerability index that we are going to show at the end of the presentation that has been very useful, not generating panic at the population or panic in the population, but introducing the self-discipline and the self-control of the population because all Colombian people understand that if they live at a block or a street block, which is in dark red, is that the discipline of being at the lockdown situation are uh, accomplishing all the social rule making of uh, decreasing the mobility uh, in this in, in, in this in, in, in this block is going to help not only to self to save their own life, but also the lives of all the people that is living on the same block, because it implies that is uh, all people that is living at the street block is people that uh, accounts with a lot of comorbidities, or for example, lung diseases or hypertension uh, comorbidities. And at the same time that we could have poor blocks uh, of the city, that we have overcrowding, overcrowding situations that could be a risk factor of the COVID-19 uh, disease. And Daniel? 
with all this information uh, that we are going to, to play at the end of the presentation, we wanted to see how the MPI dimensions and the MPI characteristics allow the Colombian government or allow the Colombian government to employ this information and this, this aggregated information in order to design, complement and implement new public policies in order to face the socioeconomic shocks of the COVID-19 disease. And that's why the Ministry of Planning and we, in a very humble way, we are sharing their voice and we are putting their voice in this presentation, was tremendously sound and fast in order to complement a pre-existent uh, public policies. For example, conditional cash transfer policies could be complemented, taking into account all this disaggregated information that puts vulnerability and poverty at the street for local level. But at the same time, uh, in the line of all the best practices that several countries around the world uh, have started to put into practice uh, with the development of unconditional cash transfers programs, taking into account all this information that the Ministry of Planning with the CSPEN master database and the National Statistics Office with the Housing and Population Census database reloaded with all the statistical information that we grasp in our uh, routine, let's say, or a statistical routine, we managed to develop in a very fast way, for example, uh, something that was like a dream for uh, people like Roberto Angulo or some uh, policymakers how are we going to develop an unconditional cash transfer in, in our country? And we managed in less than two months to develop an unconditional cash transfer program, which is called Ingreso Solidario in Spanish, that managed to target and to benefit 3 million households or families in our country that are subject to new vulnerabilities taking into account the shocks that the COVID-19 is producing in our society. At the same time, the disinformation, and which is at the uh, ground or uh, at the base or the pillar of an MPI policy that we have in our country, managed to help the coverage expansion of social programs or former conditional cash transfers programs that we have developed in the last 10 years in our country and also to, to pay a uh, historic debt that we have with poor and vulnerable households in our country, which is the VAT regressivity in our country, because we cannot have a VAT refunds in the carbon uh, uh, tax law, but in a very fast way in order to uh, decrease the shocks in the income distribution that the, uh, the deprivation of income of many households in our country that are subject to lockdowns. The government and the Ministry of Planning managed to solve very, in a very fast way, a uh, value added tax reform that covered 1 million households in our country, which is a country of 14 million households. It, from the last or the more recent population and housing census in 2018. With all this information, we managed not only to develop public policies in a very fast way at the national level, but also at the subnational level, let's say at a municipality level or at the state level. We managed to develop, for example, in Bogota, a very very smart and um, well-planned uh, unconditional cash transfers, which is called Bogota Solidario. And some other cities managed to target a uh, humanitarian uh, strategies as groceries, humanitarian groceries for very poor and vulnerable people, taking into account all the disaggregation 
anti-geolocation of poverty and vulnerable households in our country. And that's why, for example, we right now I'm going to, in a very fast way, to go to our web page of Danny in Colombia, eh, which is eh, this web, eh, this, this is the, 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 the main uh, vision of the multidimensional poverty index at a, a street block level that we have in our web page. As you can see, in a three dimensional uh, perspective, the, the heights of the blocks are related to the intensity of the multidimensional poverty index or the vulnerabilities uh, that lie behind the, the MPI in, at, the, at the street block level. But together mm -hmm. with this information, we managed to solve and to see how, for example, we can see a COVID-19 vulnerability and for example, you can see at this section of uh, the Bogota uh, street block level map that we are showing right now, how you can link together the vulnerabilities of COVID-19 taking into account health dimensions and some specific uh, household conditions and Daniel? with the multidimensional poverty index that we are seeing in at the same part of the city that we are showing at, at, at that level. But also taking into account the advantages of grasping this information at the population census or also at the household surveys, we managed to link together the information of vulnerability, for example, and multidimensional poverty that you are seeing right now at the same time with some mobility conditions that we could perform taking into account of mobile uh, cell-based stations that we have in our city and taking into account the initiative of grant data and the United Nations Development Program, we managed to- Daniel, see Daniel. Since the 2nd of eh, March- da, da, Daniel, estás how, por ahí? Uh, how, eh, un, 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 un minutito, si quieres. Si, Listo. Si, 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 how you claro. are going, how since the lockdown, the lockdown started in March 19, and you get that the city goes to blue, but you see that every day of the lockdown, you have some blocks that are still close to red, or to yellow at the at this part of the city. And this shows that the lockdown rules could not be accomplished uh, due to poverty, due to vulnerability conditions that we are uh, facing at that part of the city. And every day, this section of the city which is the poorest section and the most vulnerable section of the city, uh, taking into account the health risk factors of COVID-19. When you take out this coverage and you zoom a little bit, you start to see that you are facing a very poor section of the city from the MPI perspective, but at the same time, a very vulnerable uh, part of the city in, from COVID-19. So the main message that we wanted to share with you is that uh, MPI information is very useful to develop very sound and fast strategies, but at the same time to allow or to permit the reform of public policies to, and to develop new strategies in order to face the socioeconomic impacts of COVID-19 in our population. Thank you very much, Gonzalo and Sabina.
Thank you very much, Juan, eh, Juan Daniel. It was really amazing to, to listen to you. It is amazing how Colombia combined together information with, pol with public policy. And the maps are just amazing, Juan Daniel. I thought I was in the middle of Bogota when you showed that to, to everyone. Um, so thank you very much. We, so we still have some, some time for, for questions. Um, we may perhaps go a bit um, beyond one hour, but, but I think they are very interesting questions. So if we, if we can have some questions, Felipe, and if you could be very, very brief on Daniel, because we, we are now over the time. So thank you very much again, Juan Daniel. Uh, over to you, Felipe. Sure. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Juan Daniel, Sabina, and Monica. Um, just just before we jump to the questions, I'd just like to uh, very briefly greet our colleagues from, from the Multidimensional Poverty Peer Network. We have colleagues connecting from Kenya, Senegal, uh, Tanzania, Tunisia, Sri Lanka, Mauritius, uh, colleagues from the African Development Bank, uh, from Uganda, from UNDP in Panama, New York, and the Asia Pacific. As well as colleagues from Canada and Sweden, so so um, greetings to to all of you and thank you for for joining us. I'm going to start with a question from Bisha Tiwari, um, who is asking Monica um, that the census data um, is not uh, updated very often. So which other uh, data sources can be used uh, in order to uh, help the most vulnerable? Uh, hi, thanks a lot for the question. Uh, as Juan Daniel presented, you can use a lot of data sources. Ideally, what you would like to use is a data source that is uh, recent. Uh, in some countries, what we are doing is using survey data if it's possible, or if the census data is too old, uh, we are using these uh, registers, like the CISVENTA is like a census for a specific group of the population. So it will depend on the data that is available in the country that you can use it. If you have registered data, as in Colombia, you can merge the registered data and you can use the registered data in order to identify individuals and to create a, a vulnerability index using that data. So it, it depends on environments in each country, not every country. In Colombia, we are really lucky that we have a lot of data as Juan Daniel uh, presented, but not every country in the world has as much data. So we can use whatever uh, is available. And um, sometimes you can, in, in some countries where the census data is too old, we use the registered data or we use the latest survey in order to identify areas. And with that information, you can at least do something at the regional level and can try to go deeper uh, with other uh, strategies. Thank you, Monica. Um, there's a question for, for Juan Daniel from Gilbert Habasa. Uh, to what extent can civil registration and vital statistics as a source of information inform the COVID-19 response in Colombia? Yeah, mm, this is something very interesting. And what we see is that um, We, in order to integrate the, the census and the population census information and the CSPEN information, we, in, in, in Colombia, we, we are asking the same question and say, why don't we have a single registry of population under which we could uh, develop all the targeting uh, of public policies at the individual or household level. But in Colombia, uh, people is a bit reluctant to be completely identified uh, from the fact of their I, putting together their identification and their location or the address of the of the place they live at. So. Uh, what, what I see is that this is very sound. We, we, it would be uh, easier and it would be as master, as smarter to have a single registry. But at this moment, we have to put together the information that we grasp for public policy targeting with the housing and population census. But 
taking into account also the, the question that has been addressed to Monica, uh, I think that households uh, surveys and living standard measurement surveys uh, that are at the source or at the early beginning of MPI indices could be very in, in, could be very useful uh, at a perspective under which we link together the information of the surface with administrative records in order to especially, especially, I'm sorry, disaggregate information that we grasp in the household. So I think that the main, the main challenge that we have at the National Statistics Offices is how are we going to link together household surface information with administrative records that could help to disaggregate information and to locate and to put at the X, Y coordinates the situation of vulnerability of our population. Thank you so much, Handelin. There's a question for Sabina. Uh, if you could elaborate a little bit on Pakistan's approach using the SMS-based uh, targeting. Yes, thank you so much. Um, so Pakistan first, of course, there were analyses using the existing data sets. Um, the original data set at the district level, which was used for the MPI, more recent data sets to try to understand the joint distribution of deprivations. And then there will be a paper posted, I believe today on the OP and MPPN websites um, by Sanya Nishtar, the minister in Pakistan, um, detailing um, the process and the methodology of their uh, emergency response. They identified existing beneficiaries and allocated additional resources for them. And then they had a number that people could SMS and verified you know, what percentage of the population had cell phones or had access through their communities to cell phones to try to ascertain that this was a good program and, and some options in areas where cell phone coverage was below 95%. And then um, found administrative data on income tax, on travel abroad, on ownership of, of a car, and on salaries that they were able to use as a negative list to say who would not be eligible for these transfers or duplication in the same household. And then texted them back to say, yes, you are eligible. Come in at this day and at this time to uh, avoid the, uh, to respect the social distancing requirements so there wasn't a run on the banks. Her paper also details all of the problems, problems of people not having fingerprints, problems of going to the centers at the wrong time. Um, and so it's a very rich paper in terms of really things to know before you are setting up this kind of a system. But I think it's, it's, it's one where we can, we can learn about what to do when you don't have recent census or registry or household survey data, then what, was, what were they able to do with the administrative data that they had? in a situation where they are trying to target and not do a universal coverage. Thank you, Sabina. We're we are having a lot of questions. We're going to do our best with uh, with the little time uh, that we have. We're going to take one, uh, uh, one of the questions that just come from our viewers on YouTube. Um, I'd like to ask these two to the panelists, if you could just uh, elaborate briefly. And the question goes like this, from the experiences of COVID-19, should we expect any significant changes to the computation uh, indicators of the NPI as a methodology, especially when it comes to household shocks? Hmm. That's, Maybe I'll, that's, I'll go with, 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 uh, with Juan Daniel first. That's a very sharp question. Uh, and I think that I, I, I understood that that was like a hidden message of Sabina at her presentation. And I, I, I enjoy very much that uh, this kind of dialogues could allow us to find the answers in order to see if we are going to introduce new dimensions or new characteristics of the households in order to measure vulnerability. Because, for example, in a, situ in a pandemic situation that we could face in the following years, the, not only the sanitation indicators, but also the overcrowding information at the housing standards are going to become very, very relevant at the public policy agenda. 
So that's why I, I, I don't have a, a, a sharp answer to your sharp question, but I, what I would like is to invite uh, this kind of scenarios and the dialogue of DM, PPN, and OT, uh, which is a very important scenario that is offered to us, could be a very smart way and a smart uh, tool in order to find the answer to that question. Thank you, Felipe. Sabina, any thoughts? Yes, no, I think again, it's a very good question and we, we are in a learning process. I think that the indicators that people have wanted that they haven't necessarily had in the MPI are the overcrowding, are the informal employment that are right now not in the DHS and mix surveys um, as well, but they've also wanted things beyond monetary, because if it's only monetary, it's, it's up and down and it's very volatile and it may not tell the full situation of the household. Obviously the food insecurity and the nutrition, whichever can be obtained, um, have been very central in certain parts uh, where that is um, a, a pressing need. Um, so I think that there will be shifts, but also in terms of the age structure and when we decompose by the number of household members and the age structure and the dependency structure um, within the household. I think, of course, those are important as well. And so just making that kind of analysis routine, which is easy to do um, if the data permit it, uh, will, I think, be, be useful uh, going forward as well. Um, so I think, I think that's there. I think one particular challenge right now is that there are rapid remote surveys, World Bank, UNICEF, UNDP, that are putting out I don't know the extent to which they cover non-monetary, non-employment related um, issues that might be pertinent. And so I think uh, there will be a conversation to be had about the contents of those, the rapid remote surveys in the time period in which they are the primary data collection tool. Over. Thank you, Sabina. Um, one, one of uh, our participants was asking, uh, Monica, I think whether you could repeat the paper um, you were just mentioning, uh, and also which areas uh, of Africa has there been intervention um, during these COVID-19 times? Hey, I think it's a paper that uh, Juan, David, uh, Juan Daniel mentioned and is in the, in the chat box, that is uh, building a COVID-19 vulnerability index is in there. Um, and in the countries of Africa, we have been working with several countries in developing their national MPIs, and we are uh, in conversations with some of them uh, for the uh, multidimensional vulnerability index. But because we, this is a uh, private information, we cannot reveal the names of the, of the countries. So what I can say is that we have been working with countries in their national MPIs and how they can use their national MPIs to inform policy uh, to, the, to give a response for the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Thank you, Monica. Um, okay, so we're gonna start to uh, wrap up. Just gonna uh, ask the, the last question that, that we have coming from one of our colleagues uh, in Nepal. And how can people update their data if needed? And how do people get information about the vulnerability index score of their street block? and how is a, a, assistance adjusted to that vulnerability profile. So maybe in this, this first one, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with, uh, with Sabina, and then uh, Juan Daniel, if you have any thoughts on that, I will go over to you next. Thank you so much. I think that um, in each country, it's a matter of finding out the most recent data. Nepal has 2016 demographic and health survey data, but that's quite mm -hmm. old. It has a recent census and it also has registry data that are used for targeting purposes. And so it would be a matter of um, working with the uh, CBS, the Center of Bureau of Statistics in Nepal, to, to find out the data that they have and, and how it can be worked and put together in support of the policy responses at this time. Um, but I think that it, another question for us as a community is how, given what we've just seen from Colombia, and given that many countries don't have the richness of a census, but we're coming up to the 2020 round, how can we, in our different national contexts or international organizations, make sure that some of the questions are put into the census that reflect the MPI? And I don't know if Juan Daniel would want to use his moment to say how you did that in Colombia. But when you have those questions in the census, 
then all of a sudden it's power um, to support uh, poverty ac activities uh, just expands. Thank you, Serena. Juan Daniel? Yeah, I, what I think is that, for example, I'm, my, my main professional experience is not related to being a chief statistician. But what I see as a citizen is that normally uh, we are very reluctant of providing information uh, and private information to national statistics office because we are always under the shadow of the confidentiality and the privacy concerns that we have about this information. But sitting at this chair and being the national uh, statistician of Colombia, the social value of this information in a crisis situation or an emergency situation that we have right now uh, overpass all the concerns or all the concerns of populations about the confidentiality of this information. And that's why National Statistics Office in the last four years have started to place the main questions is how are we going to become not only statisticians, but also data stewards. And in order to manage in a very sound and ethical way, the disaggregated information that we grasp in order to keep it safe, but in order to keep it fresh at the same time, in order to provide answers in such situations like the one we are facing right now. So I think that the, the, this, this emergency situation that we are facing is putting at the public policy concern the high value of information and the very important uh, way of developing evidence-based public policy taking into account the availability of this information. This is the main message that I, I wanted to insist on in this answer. Thank you so much, uh, Juan Daniel and all the panelists. I'm afraid we have to close the Q&A session here. Just before uh, passing it on to Gonzalo, also like to greet uh, colleagues who are connecting from Jamaica, from India, and from Nepal. Uh, it's great, great to see you in, in the chat boxes, all of our MPPN uh, participants. So we're going to go to closing words with Gonzalo. Gracias, Felipe. Thank you very much. I think we went over one hour, but I think it was worth it because, because I think we, we, we show, and, and Daniel and Sabina and Monica showed that really investing in information is very important. Sometimes it's difficult, and sometimes when we are assigning budgets to information, we say, well, why don't we assign it to, a, to other things? But when you have a problem like the one we have now, and we, we can see that Colombia was able to produce sound public policy because they have sound information uh, for, for some years ago, then it, it is clear, as Juan Daniel said, that investing in information, investing in research, investing in indicators is very important. So, so, so thank you very much to all of you. Uh, I have to remind you that we have the same, the same webinar, but later it's going to be <laughs> uh, 2 p.m. Colombia time. So if you are around, uh, please uh, be with us. Uh, thank you very much. Over to you, Sabina. I also would like to echo thanks to everyone for, for coming and to say that we would really also like to hear from you in two ways. One is if there are problems that you're facing that this community could help sort of look at and, and talk about, please do send them our way and we can connect you if we can with others who are facing similar things or have overcome them. And the second is, if this has been helpful, and if you think it would be useful um, to have these in the future, please do not be shy. Please either volunteer yourself and say, look, you know, there's this thing that we're doing that's related to multidimensional poverty and COVID that others might want to learn from. Or this is something where I think it would be really useful to have a discussion and find out who is doing this well. I think we're in a time where we can learn together. So I think we would love to hear from you and, and your advice about how we can be useful to each other in this time. Um, and so I will 
I'll end there and just think that by holding together and encouraging and supporting and learning, hopefully we'll be able to make that, that shift that Sen talked about, um, despite all of the challenges that we're facing. So thank you for what you do and for being with us today. Thank you, Zarina. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Juan Daniel. It was really great. Thank you, Felipe. It was really great. Uh, thank you very much. And I'll see you later in the day. Thank you. Bye. Bye -bye. Thank you, Colombia, for this seminar in, in Espanol. Bye. Thank okay, you. bye.